Hello and welcome to 2021 in service bloodborne pathogens. Hello and welcome to 2022 bloodborne pathogens in service. The purpose of this lesson is to familiarize you with the various bloodborne pathogen methods to reduce exposure and the steps to follow in the event of exposure to a bloodborne pathogen. At the end of this block of instruction, you will be able to achieve the following objectives in accordance with the information received during the instruction period. Review the purpose of the Bloodborne Pathogen Standard in OSHA 29 CFR 1910-1030. Characterize the general symptoms and epidemiology of bloodborne diseases. Distinguish the modes of transmission for bloodborne pathogens. Identify tasks and other activities which may involve exposure to blood or other potential infectious materials. Demonstrate methods which prevent or reduce exposure to blood or other potential infectious materials. And illustrate the appropriate selection, storage, use, and disposal of personal protective equipment. Lastly, outline the components of the employer's bloodborne exposure control plan to include appropriate actions and persons to contact an emergency involving blood or other potential infectious materials, procedure to follow if the exposure incident occurs, and information on post-exposure evaluation and follow-up. The Bloodborne Pathogen Standard 29 CFR 1910-1030 the Occupational Safety and Health Administration first implemented the Bloodborne Pathogen Standard in July of 1992. It was revised in January of 2001. The OSHA regulations apply to all private employers with more than 10 employees and employees of the federal government. The purpose of the standard is to publish occupational safety guidelines and regulations to reduce or eliminate employee exposure to bloodborne pathogens. Bloodborne pathogens, virus and infectious agents which are carried in human blood and other potential infectious materials are considered bloodborne pathogens. The ones most often mentioned are hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus, human immune deficiency virus, HIV, and other resistant viruses such as MRSA. Other potential infectious materials, bloodborne pathogens, can also be contained in other bodily fluids. These include semen, vaginal secretions, saliva, ambiotic fluid, and other bodily fluid or matter in which may contain blood. Exposure. Any incident where the employee has non-intact skin, eye, mouth, mucous membrane, contact with blood or other potential infectious materials. Exposure control. These include administrative controls such as providing vaccinations, infection, preventative procedures, and training programs. Engineering controls are physical barriers to exposure such as sharp, safe evidence containers and biohazard labels, as well as eye and hand washing stations. Work practice controls, actual procedures following to reduce exposure. Work practice controls make the administrative and engineering controls effective. All the policies and labels in the world will not help if they are not used. Work practice control also involve the use of personal protective equipment, which will be discussed later in this outline. Symptoms and epidemiology. There are many bloodborne diseases and we're going to talk about a few. The first one, hepatitis B. We're all familiar with it and have learned it in the past. Again, this affects the liver and there's over 5.7 million people in the United States that are affected by this. And these are, again are HBV and HCV. Some of the signs and symptoms are jaundice, fatigue, fever, loss of appetite, nausea, abdominal pain. Hepatitis C is also very common uh, among, among chronic bloodborne pathogen diseases. Uh, affects quite a few people in the United States.
There's no vaccine for HCV, HIV, human immune deficiency virus, uh, also known as AIDS, is when the body is unable to defend itself against infection and mutated cells. Again, several people, a million people in the United States are living with HIV. Some of the signs and symptoms are night sweats, headaches, fever, fatigue, muscle pain, joint pain. Other diseases, uh, blood borne pathogen diseases are MRSA. MRSA is a staph infection. Signs and symptoms um, are, can be similar to like a spider bite. However, unless you actually see the spider, it's not m most likely a spider bite, but a skin infection, which again is also known as MRSA, it can appear as a bump in affected area. Maybe red, swollen, painful, warm to the touch also can be accompanied by fever. Modes of transmission. The five main methods of transmission of bloodborne pathogens are contact, droplet, air, food, and vector. The first three are the most common and most likely what you're exposed in, to in the workplace. Contact exposure, this is the most common mode of exposure. This just would be direct contact which is exposure occurs when the pathogen is passed directly from one person to another. Indirect is when contact exposure occurs when the pathogen is contracted by touching the surface of material where infected blood or other potential material was left. Droplet exposure. This type of exposure occurs when droplets of blood or other potential infectious material containing infectious pathogens are expelled during coughing, sneezing, talking and transferred to, to that person through mucous membranes. This typically takes place from a distance up to six feet. Airborne exposure are similar to droplet exposure, but airborne exposures take place when an infected person expels blood or other infectious material when sneezing, coughing, etc., and the pathogen enters the body through micro droplets through the respiratory tract. Risk of exposure. Law enforcement officers are always at great risk of exposure to many of the tasks that we perform on a daily basis. Direct contact with those infected or hosting bloodborne pathogens while we provide medical or first aid care, being bitten by a suspect, indirect while we are processing a crime scene, touching contaminated surfaces, being stuck by a suspect's hypodermic needle. Driving through airborne exposure may occur anytime when the officer is close to someone who's hosting a bloodborne pathogen. Activities from taking a report, talking to a victim, all that puts us at risk. Helping minimize the risk. There's some precautions that we can take to help minimize our risk of getting contaminated with bloodborne pathogens. The standard precautions are Avoid any contact with blood or other potential infectious materials. Wear disposable gloves when touching individuals and change gloves when you're touching different people. Cover up any cuts, scrapes uh, while you're working. Use personal protective uh, PPE. Wash hands or use sanitizer whenever possible. Dispose all contaminated PPE carefully, properly. Clean all disinfectant clothing equipment which may be contaminated. Transmission-based precautions. Transmission-based precautions are used in addition to standard precautions. They should also be used when dealing with individuals who are known to be infected. Again, this may be utilizing gloves, PPE, also using a mask. Workplace controls. As mentioned earlier, workplace controls are procedures which must be followed to maintain safety in the workplace. Work practice controls include you no know, smoking, eating, drinking, or handling contact while your contact lenses or applying makeup, lip balm. Also, food should not be stored in the refrigerator where there's evidence stored also. Personal protective equipment or PPE. Personal protective equipment is specially designed for clo clothing or equipment which is worn to protect against bloodborne hazards. 
one type of gloves. Disposable gloves should be worn anytime there's a risk, whether received or actual gloves should be worn, even if you do not have any areas of non-intact skin. Gowns when processing a crime scene where there's a possibility of splattering or splashing or providing emergency medical care to a victim with mass trauma, a gown should be worn. Mask. Mask should be used anytime there's a chance of splashing or splattering of blood or other potential infectious materials in order to protect mucous membranes or nasal passages. And again, we're all custom wearing masks now. Eye protection. There's a risk of exposure of blood, other potential infectious material of splashing or splattering or mucous membranes in the eyes should be protected. This can be accomplished by a safe mask or a face mask or safety glasses. Normal prescription eyewear is not sufficient protection. CPR shields. Whenever you're giving rescue breaths, you should use a CPR breathing barrier. There's a variety of these, but a Anytime that you're giving rescue breasts, a mask should be used. And anytime evidence or other materials are being stored, there should be proper packaging disposal. Exposure Control Plan. Every agency's exposure control plan is reviewed annually and updated as needed. The plan must include a list of employees, the job classification, and the schedule of methods of implementation of all elements of this plan if there was an exposure. Every employee should be given an opportunity to receive the HPV vaccine if needed or if wanted. Also, actions must be uh, taken to include the name of the position and title of a person to contact if there is an exposure. There should also be exposure incident takes place. The employee must provide the employee with confidential medical evaluation and follow-ups. This evaluation must be conducted by a licensed healthcare professional. It must have the following elements. Documentation of the route of exposure and circumstances around the exposure. Identification and documentation of the source individual. North Carolina requires that the source individual be tested unless the individual is already known to be positive for HIV or HPV. Results of the test are to be provided to the employee, but the employee must be made aware of the confidential requirements regarding this information. The employee's blood must be collected and sampled unless the employee does not want the blood tested. If that is the case, the blood must be kept for 90 days in case the employee changes their mind. Any post-exposure prevention measures uh, will also be recommended by the CDC. Also provide counseling and evaluation of any reported illnesses. In the Durham County Exposure Control Plan, General Order 715, Infectious Disease Control, custody procedures is spoke about. Persons suspected of being included in a high-risk group such as intravenous drug users and prostitutes should be treated with special caution, particularly where violence or injuries have occurred. Extreme caution should be used in the search of prisoners and suspected drug dealers or drug users to prevent accidental skin punctures or contaminated needles, especially when reaching into areas that are not readily visible. After the completion of the task or search where protective disposable gloves are utilized, they should be removed with caution and disposed properly. Subjects with bodily fluid or blood present on their person should be transported separately from other prisoners whenever possible. Officers have obligation to inform other personnel, such as uh, firefighters, paramedics, nurses, detention officers, and other deputies whenever a change in transfer custody occurs and the subject has blood or bodily fluids present on his person or has made voluntary statement indicating that he has been infected with a contagious disease.
in reference to decontamination procedures, decontamination procedures should be properly activated when law enforcement vehicle agency issued equipment or other work services of the sheriff's office have contaminated with blood or other potential infectious diseases or materials. Decontamination procedures are as follows. Protective gloves should be worn during this procedure. Any excessive blood or bodily fluid should be wiped up with approved absorbent materials. The affected area will be cleaned with disinfectant solution and allowed to air dry for 10 minutes. All contaminated clean materials shall be placed in plastic bags, sealed with disposable bags in a contaminated waste receptacle. If decontamination procedures will be delayed, the contaminated vehicle item or surface shall be clearly labeled biohazard. Should a uniform or clothing of an officer be contaminated by blood or bodily fluids in the line of duty, the field supervisor shall temporarily relieve the officer from duty as soon as feasible in order to bathe or the infected or changed clothing. Contaminated clothing should be handled as little as possible with minimum aggregation to avoid flaking of the fine particles or have them flow in the air or maybe be inhaled. Contaminated clothing should be sealed in a red biohazard bag so the person can recognize the container as required compliance with universal precautions. Contaminated clothing may be cleaned at EMS Station 6 on Milton Road or EMS Station 2 on Old Fayetteville Road. Process and handling storage of contaminated property or, or evidence. Evidence and property containing uh, that has contaminated with subjects blood or body fluid should be handled with gloves. If it's a stain, the sample is air dried and placed in a paper bag properly sealed and marked biohazard. Needles and other sharp items should be placed in a rigid protective containers properly labeled and approved for this purpose. Liquid evidence samples should be collected as a liquid and stored in an approved container or located on clothing or similar materials should be air dried and packaged as such. Dispose of contaminated waste. All the contaminated waste materials shall be placed in a biohazard bag as specified in this order and disposed and contaminated waste receptacle at any EMS base or county fire department. Occupational exposure incidents. I recommend everyone reading uh, this part of the policy uh, in greater detail due to the fact that this contains a lot of material. Also, be advised, Durham County is in the process of appointing a new infection control officer, which should be in place shortly. When dealing with occupational exposure incidents, Written documentation will be prepared whenever an employee has cause to believe they have experienced occupational exposure incident. An occupational exposure incident means a specific eye, mouth, or other mucous membranes on non-tack skin or partial contact with blood or other potential infectious materials resulting from the performance of the employee's duties. Examples of these include direct unprotected contact from blood or bodily fluids from another person within or other items containing with blood or bodily fluids from another person when officer has cuts, abrasions, or open sores in the contact area, direct mouth-to-mouth -mouth CPR, the receiving of a puncture wound from a contaminated needle or a cut from a contaminated sharp item, the receiving of a human bite results in penetration of the officer's skin, direct contact of blood, or other bodily fluids from the eyes, mouth, or other mucous membranes. When an occupational exposure incident occurs, the affected officer will immediately notify his supervisor and prepare a written code one, detailing the circumstance and exposure, the identity of the source, if known, and prior to ending the tour of duty uh, on which the exposure incident occurred. All documentation relating to the exposure incident will be forwarded to up chain of command. The employee supervisor shall investigate the incident, exposure incident to determine whether or not the officer complied with all safety precautions. The, officer, the employee supervisor will notify the infection control officer who will coordinate treatment and testing of the employee and the source. The supervisor will contact Corvell and obtain permission to treatment of the test of the employee. The physician testing the employee will be advised of the contact information for the physician 
of the source of the patient. If the source exposure is to be transported to the hospital, Corvell must advise of the, be advised of this, and every effort should be made to expose the person and the source treated at the same facility in order to streamline the information flow. If the source individual is a arrestee, the magistrate should be advised of exposure immediately upon arriving at the detention center. Upon finding probable cause exists and exposure took place, the magistrate shall order the defendant held up with 24 hours investigating and testing by utilizing the side 2 form of the AOC CR 270. The medical director of the, of the jail health is considered attending physician of the source and Durham County Detention Center medical director shall determine if the medical records exist for the source. If medical records exist to review any history of HIV, hepatitis B, uh, testing results. If results are found, we'll share this information with the physician of the exposed. If no prior testing res uh, results exist, medical director should order HIV and hepatitis B testing. Share test results with the physician of exposed as soon as available and ensure a blood drawn if indicated prior to Rusty's release. If the source is not incarcerated, the primary physician, the attending physician of the exposed should make contact with the phys physician of the source to discuss the situation. If the source is not incarcerated and does not have a primary health care physician, the Durham County Health Department will be contacted. The local health director will be notified of the contact information of the intending physician of the exposed employee in order to coordinate testing and treatment if needed. All occupational exposure incidents occurred on the job were reported to risk management. Department by completing the Durham County Government Occupational Injury Illness Report the risk management department will prepare necessary documentation for the North Carolina Industry Commission in accordance with Durham County's policy, procedures, and workers' compensation. Post-exposure evaluation follow-up. In the event that an employee experiences an occupational exposure incident, the agency will make available at no cost to the exposed employee a confidential medical evaluation and follow-up by the agency's designated health care professional. The post-exposure evaluation follow-up will include the following elements. Documentation of the route of exposure and circumstances under which the exposure incident occurred. Identification and documentation of the source individual unless such identification is not feasible or is prohibited by state or local law. If consent is obtained, the source's individual below will be tested as soon as feasible in order to determine HBV and HIV infection. When the source individual's consent is not required by law, the source individual blood, if available, will be tested and results documented. Results from the source's individual testing, if conducted, shall be made available to the exposed employee and employees shall be informed of occupational laws, regards, regulations concerning disclosure of the identity and infectious status of the source individual. If consent is obtained and the exposed employee's Blood will be collected as soon as feasible and tested for HIV and HPV when medically indicated post-exposure treatment, including any necessary counseling, evaluation of uh, reported illnesses will be provided and exposure exposed employee as recommended by the U.S. Public Health Service. In recapping our objectives, we review the purpose of the Bloodborne Pathogen Standard in OSHA 29 CFR 1910-1030. We characterize the general symptoms and epidemiology of bloodborne diseases, and we distinguish the modes of transmission for bloodborne pathogens. We also identify tasks and other activities which may involve exposure to blood or other potential infectious materials. We demonstrated methods which prevent or reduce exposure to blood or other potential infectious materials. And we illustrated the appropriate selection of storage use and disposal of personal protective equipment. And lastly, we outlined the components of our employer's bloodborne exposure control plan to include appropriate actions of persons to contact an emergency involving blood or potential infectious materials, procedures to follow if the exposure incident occurs and information on post-exposure evaluation and follow-up.